Welcome to the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. In this series, we'll bring you 12 of the best talks from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime. This episode is called Organised Crime and the Russian-Ukrainian War. Welcome to this uh, panel called Organised Crime and Russia-Ukrainian War. Of course, in criminology, we don't have a special area of crime of war, but we do have our criminology of organized crime. And this the conference is uh, uh, all about organized crime. So this panel will focus on the recent war, on the ongoing war uh, between Russia and Ukraine. And we have today three presentations, uh, which will deal specifically with the link between organized crime and this war. Um, in this session, um, you can pose questions. You can uh, write them either on um, Q&A or uh, in chat, uh, and we will answer, we will discuss them after the presentations. So I will immediately start with uh, presenting um, the first speaker, speakers, um, Oleksiy Serdyuk, who is now in Kharkiv, and I hope he still has uh, electricity at this moment because there is a kind of um, very unclear situation at the moment uh, there. And Anna Markovska, um, they will present a paper on the wartime organized criminal activity in Ukraine uh, based on media reports and evidences from Kharkiv and Odessa. Alexei Serdyuk is uh, head of, Russia, uh, of a research la la lab for psychological support uh, for law enforcement at Kharkiv National University of Internal Affairs. And Anna Markovska is a deputy head of Policing uh, Research Institute of Easter Program of Anglia Ruskin University uh, in the United Kingdom. Um, the floor is yours, Alexei. I suppose you will start, or Anna? I will. I will start. I'll introduce us. Thank you. Thank you, Dina. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, today uh, we are presenting. Uh, we are jointly presenting a paper on war and organized crime. Um, as um, you could see, well, Alexei is based in Ukraine, in the city of Kharkiv and uh, I am uh, in Cambridge. So we do hope that uh, if everything goes well, Alexei would be able to, to join the presentation. This is probably one of the presentation that um, uh, we would never um, think that we would be doing actually in life. And uh, it's uh, deeply emotional and deeply and very difficult um, uh, subject to discuss. However, as Dina mentioned, for the for the purpose of this presentation, we are discussing the issues of um, organized crime and the opportunities and uh, the, the the way how organized crime, well, I suppose, changes uh, in the world with the war and specifically in Ukraine. And um, we would like to perhaps start by just generally introducing the subject of war and organized crime. And what was quite uh, um, interesting and uh, relevant is all those comparisons with, that came to mind from 24th of uh, uh, February and comparisons to the World War II. Um, for example, when we talk about the um, we remember from history that uh, in London bleeds in 1941, um, th there were reports of looting, stolen goods, black market for food, uh, a number of murders and gang crimes. Uh, for example, the, uh, the rationing and the food rationing was a particularly um, way to introduce sort of black market opportunities. So you, we would see the opportunities for low level criminality and with Alexei, we'll discuss it in a minute. So we we are particularly interested in the issue of ideology, uh, ideologies, different ideologies and politics in wartime organized crime. And we would like to share some of um, some, some of our, our thoughts about this. And also Alexei will present the results of the security and trust survey and um, and the way how the people of Kharkiv and Kharkiv region view criminality, uh, maybe a little bit before the war and um, as of post 24th of February. Just a few pictures of the, just to, to bring in the, um, 
the issues, I suppose, of uh, resemblances between the two wars. Um, uh, we, we will talk about the uh, crimes of looting. And um, again, we've seen it through throughout the, I suppose, different wars. And on, on your left side, you see the uh, destroyed buildings in London in 1941, destroyed buildings in Ukraine, and the um, vigilante justice, those people who uh, wanted to steal something in one of the cities in Ukraine. Uh, we see that how similar are the daily problems of security to people who experienced war in 1941 and for the uh, people of Kharkiv in uh, 2022, people who had to live in the underground for um, a number of months. And um, we see how shortages and opportunities um, uh, exist and how they develop during the war. And uh, it was interesting with Alexei yesterday, we were discussing the issues around the black markets and the opportunity of black markets and uh, discussing the Second World War, for example, we were looking at the issue of uh, black market and food and thinking around the issues of uh, what are the current developments uh, in Ukraine. And what we have noticed is that there are not that many reports of uh, reselling, for example, uh, goods, humanitarian aids. There are some, but they're not dominating. What dominates is this incredible uh, rise in civic movements and volunteering. And, um, and it's something else to, 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 to discuss perhaps uh, later on. So what we would like to, before I um, Alexei takes over, um, we would like to point to the different realities for different regions. This today, when we talk about Ukraine, we talk about very different experiences of different regions. We talk about the experiences of the, well, the war obviously covers the whole country, but specific regions experience uh, very specific problems. Uh, and again, we might uh, touch on this uh, later on in the discussion. So in terms of the uh, organized crime, so our ideas and suggestions to discuss is that uh, generally speaking, war and instability, isn't it, is a threat to organized crime. So in terms of security issues, in terms of broken links and broken supply uh, channels, you also have the issue of increased visibility. You have the issue of added public scrutiny. And then there is a very interesting dynamics and very interesting issue of ideologies. Who do you stand with? Um, we notice some anecdotal evidence from different regions and more specifically recently from the occupied territories uh, of Kharkiv region. How, again, it's anecdotally, how different uh, uh, low level, what we would call generally low level organized criminal groups in a particular village would decide to collaborate with the occupiers and would sort of change the side. And again, it brings the a very interesting issue of ideologies and organized crime. So what we want to sort of position as a, uh, as a point to discuss is that war present a threat to large scale organized criminality. And in the same time, an opportunity for smaller, maybe local based uh, criminal groups. And now Alexei will take over from me. Alexei, are you, are you there? I'm there and uh, I want to present some data. When we speak about organized criminality, we speak about different uh, levels of criminality, bottom level, upper level, uh, but the data during this war not presented. Uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs collecting this data, but not presenting. So we can say uh, about something about the dynamic structure, what changed. But we uh, have our own survey. Uh, we have research project. It's this is annual project uh, performed by my university. Project Security and Trust Survey. Uh, this is web-based survey conducted on the annual base. We collect data on uh, uh, victimological indicators, trust to police performers. We measure different types of indicators, and um, we can compare what happened with regular criminality, and then uh, hypothesis that uh, something similar happens with organized criminality. So we can see how war affected to, to the regular crime. Regular crimes 
also not presented in open statistics during this war. So uh, this is only one source that we have uh, to make inferences about dynamic of crime. Uh, usually we collect each year more than 10,000 uh, responses, but this year complicated by war, we collect only among uh, four and a half thousand responses. Um, location of our respondents, uh, Kharkiv region, but they internally displace it. And uh, in the fact, these respondents go to the whole uh, territory of Ukraine. Uh, 48 persons currently not living at home, not in Kharkiv. 15 persons left Kharkiv but returned home and 37 persons uh, do not change their location so they still uh, all the times of this war uh, live in Kharkiv. Uh, we can compare pre-war data and in-war data. This with here you see uh, frequency when uh, our respondents um, seen on or heard about different types of uh, criminal activities. So before the war, uh, most often uh, offenses was stealing, violation of public order, drug distribution and alcohol related problems. So many times or regularly uh, among 20 persons uh, witnessed this, uh, these illegal actions. In war now, uh, I want to say the data is still collecting. So this is ongoing survey. Now we are still collecting the data, uh, but uh, we have enough to make preliminary, see on preliminary results. Now we see that structure of uh, criminality do not change. It. This for certain type, most often type of um, Criminality, stealing, public order, drugs and alcohol still on the first place. This is most often crimes uh, that our respondents witness it uh, in the area where they live. But we add to our uh, list of um, unlawful actions, uh, direct combat operations, missile bombing and artillery shelling and looting. This is new types of criminality. If we compare this regular criminality. So we can compare uh, here the bars uh, demonstrate uh, the respondents witnessed at least once with this certain type of criminality. This is the most often type of criminality is missile bombing and artillery shelling. It's understanding, but this is not criminal actions, uh, but looting uh, connected with war actions this is new type of criminality, usually not appeared in the peaceful uh, lives of our respondents. But even this new type of criminality, not in the top of our list, we, not on the top of the um, list of usual criminality, but what we see, we see that war affected on the crime, uh, the crime decrease, significantly decrease uh, all type of crimes during this war. So we can make inference that with organized crime happens something similar. War uh, affecting on the crime, decreasing this type of crimes. Uh, demonstrate as percent of respondents who witnessed certain type of crimes many times and regularly. So this is a regular crime. So 60% of our respondents witnessed missile bombing attacks. So they don't think about something else. If you under artillery or bomb attack, you don't think about stealing or vandalism actions. Um, we see that also significant decrease of general criminality structure, keep it the same, the same structure, but significantly decrease it. In, in our survey, we ask him uh, also open-ended questions and uh, perform the content analysis of open-ended uh, answers of our respondents. We are asking what the problems you face it uh, related to law enforcement in your city or village in the place where you live. Uh, please say us what problems with security in the city where you live. 
So you are welcome to compare pre-war and in-war uh, cloud of words describing what problems experienced uh, Ukrainians during this war. <laughs> Please find uh, differences. I uh, mark three differences. This is curfew, immediately war, and looting. So these small words on the left, cloud, curfew, uh, means violating of cur curfew. And uh, looting, this is new types of criminality, but other the same. So problems completely the same. They just decreased. We ask in our respondents, what you expect from the local police? What you want comparing in-war and pre-war data? I think you uh, see, see no differences. They completely the same. So expectations remain the similar from police. Protect, order, justice, law. What connected with organized crime? It's corruption. In our survey, we ask him annually, we ask him about level of corruption, what they think, how they experience the corruption, in which situations. So we see that a uh, red line, this is general corruption experience, general person of our respondents uh, experience corruption. Each year we see decrease uh, in war and pre-war, corruption decreased uh, twice before war, it was 20% of respondents faced corruption in war, just 10 persons. But inside, among these respondents, structure of uh, this corruption activities changes. We see that uh, extortion of bribe decrease, uh, voluntary bribing the same, and we see increase of using of connections. We see the dynamic of organized crime in Ukraine. Uh, we see that uh, this is recorded by police, number of criminal groups. Uh, we see that each year we observe increasing of organized criminality in Ukraine. This is all what I want to present, uh, this preliminary data. Anna, uh, say a few conclusions of our Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alexei. And ju just to conclude in, in a couple of, in a minute or so, so, what we uh, want to sort of pose for, for discussion with you is that war is a significant disorganization. And as such, um, we argue that it is probably bad for the uh, upper world and uh, it might actually present new opportunities for the underworld organized criminals. Uh, what we have also witnessed is that uh, at least in the, in the Ukrainian territories, uh, we've seen better law enforcement and policing, which uh, might mean more visibility, right? Uh, and in a sense, bad for organized crime. We see quite powerful volunteering and civil society movements. And again, that sort of... Um, those sort of movements, uh, they uh, create a very positive effect in the fight against corruption and potentially bad for organized crime. We also see, we haven't discussed it here, uh, actually, but change in legal landscape. Uh, before the war, the legal system, and there were quite a number of le legal changes uh, that uh, the society has been through and uh, currently it's a constantly changing legal landscape that uh, some may, might argue might be um, sort of a, a ground for um, uh, that could be sort of potentially good for underworld organized criminals. A very interesting topic that uh, we might later on in the discussion stop is the um, what Alexei actually <laughs> argued yesterday that uh, we should call it the enemy of the front lines and the dangers that the new newly deoccupied territories would present. Um, it's the sort of underworld organized criminal activities in this sort of uh, gray zones, the zones were under the occupation then deoccupied and the ability to police these zones is uh, extremely limited and really, really difficult. It has a number of significant challenges. And, and then, of course, it's the problem of uh, politics and the problem of um, terror and organized crime and the problem of defining terror and uh, organized crime in, in context of terror and terror states. 
Thank you. That's all from us. Thank you very much, Anna. Thank you very much, Alexi. Um, very interesting uh, presentation and, uh, of course, raises a lot of questions. I hope we will have enough time to answer them. Um, then the next speaker will be uh, André Dufle Tejera Aranega, uh, who will present uh, his findings on the crime conflict nexus. Um, in the context of Russia-Ukrainian uh, conflict uh, and on emerging security implications as a result of this uh, war. And um, Andre is a, a researcher from the International Relations Institute of the Pontifical Catholic University of Rio de Janeiro. Andre, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Andrea Araneaga, and it is a pleasure to be here once again at the 24-hour conference to share some of the theoretical and empirical discussions that are being promoted at the heart of an ongoing research that I'm developing in collaboration with a colleague about the crime conflict nexus in the current Russo-Ukrainian conflict, its interconnections and security implications. Of course, since we are dealing with an ongoing armed conflict, I should highlight that this is not an attempt to anticipate or predict the future of the conflict, nor to express the exact exact shapes in which illicit networks will have at the end of the, the conflict. Our goal is simply to promote plausible inferences based on findings extracted by scientific papers, academic books, and news reports so far available about the history of illicit markets, criminal organizations, and conflict in Ukraine, Russia, and Eastern Europe. Firstly, we begin exploring the debates and evidence of the crime conflict nexus so as to take a deep dive into the current Russo-Ukrainian conflict, and in order to identify patterns of illicit activities and how they might change both during and after the end of the conflict. At last, along with plausible reflections about the criminogenic nature of the Russo-Ukrainian conflict, we hope to conclude our, our study by evaluating its interconnections and emerging security implications at the local, national, regional, and global levels. So studies dealing with the relationship between illicit economies and conflict are to be found in the intersections of several research areas and sub areas. Throughout the decades, experts showed how illicit economies evolved across time and space and side by side with its illicit, with its licit side, whether through the provision of prohibited goods or services, several states and non-state actors got involved in illicit economies to pursue wealth and power based on the most complex illicit supply chains that range from the local to the global level. Independently of traditional or network based structures, the type of illicit market and despite the involvement of other forms of violent non-state actors, the role of organized crime as one of the major agents in illicit economies is a constant trend and its role in turning illicit markets into trend multipliers in conflict settings is undiscussable. This, case, this context is what gave rise to the so-called crime conflict nexus, its different approaches and empirical cases. In summary, what one needs to consider is that despite research challenges, the nexus is often used to discuss cases in which fragile and conflict states have lootable resources, weak institutional frameworks, and a dysfunctional state. Having said that, one must consider that although illicit economies are driving features of post-war states, their influence and manifestation are only possible due to its connections to the pre-conflict period. And as a consequence, this means one must pay attention to the role of illicit economies in a conflict or the, low, or the role of a conflict in the dynamics of illicit economies based on a threefold division, its onset, duration, and intensity. As you can see on this slide, there are several risk drivers and variables where we can identify the feedback relationship between crime and conflict. On these stages, illicit economies can harm the, su the success of peace processes by hijacking post-conflict economies and liberalization attempts, not to mention the dilemmas that rise due to irresponsible policy priorities and reforms implemented in the post-war period and the establishment of corrupt alliances between state and non-state actors. In order to understand the relationship between the Russo-Ukrainian conflict and illicit economies, it is important to consider two backgrounds, a historical geopolitical one and an illicit market-oriented background. On one side, Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet space is a contested neighborhood due to historical transformations in power relationships, hegemonic disputes between the West and the non-West, 
with the US, NATO, EU, uh, EU, Ukraine, Russia vector being a generator of instability and with sovereignty and an existing existential threats being an identifiable pattern in the region. In this sense, the Euro Maiden revolution, the Russian annexation of Crimea, along with the Russian recognition of separatist zones in the Donbass conflict were crucial events to the conflict's eruption. On the other side, we also must consider the background that says that Europe is a destination, tra transit, and source space for the most distinguished types of illicit economies that connects both European countries within themselves and then with extra regional countries. And despite some differences in terms of, of dynamics, most of its dynamics can be captured through the West-East axis, where specific illicit economies tend to connect very specific countries in a complex illicit supply chain that shared similar challenges in the post-Soviet space, such as those highlighted on this slide. And last but not least, besides the diversity of illicit economies, the corrupt and criminal alliances between state and non-state actors is also an important element of the current Russo-Ukrainian uh, conflict. After highlighting these aspects, one can finally redirect its attention to possible outcomes of the current conflict in the dynamics of illicit economies. So, What's going to happen in Ukraine in the next few years or in the next few months? The adaptation in smuggly hubs or strategic routes? Illicit markets will under, uh, undermine Ukraine's success during the war in producing negative effects on post-war recovery? Violent note state actors will fill the gap produced by uh, the change of priorities in state institutions and their weakness to provide both licit and illicit goods and services? Will we see Increasing the use of illicit channel for transactions, money laundering, corruption, arms trafficking, drug trafficking, uh, illegal unregulated and unreported fishing, extortion, increase of human trafficking and, and, and exploitation, uh, considering the refugee crisis that Eastern Europe is facing right now. Uh, we'll, we'll see increase in illicit markets for medical supply, the infiltration of post-war institutions, or who knows, maybe we will be seeing unintended consequences of sanctions-based illicit markets target at Russia. Uh, we'll see, uh, we will see the decreasing community-based resilience, human security and development, increasing collaborations between organized crime groups in Ukraine and Russia and beyond, connecting different regions from the world with Ukraine. Uh, we will see new collaborations between organized crime in these countries and other types of violent non-state actors, such as insurgents or terrorist groups. We'll see the increase uh, of risk of political fragility, violence and stability in the future, the geopolitical use of illicit economies, such as the one that Russia is doing uh, basically in decades. And maybe we are going to see a change in the demand or supply with the Russia control of the Donbass region. In reality, we don't have an answer to these questions because this is an ongoing conflict. So basically, when we are discussing interconnections and security implications, and despite the conflict not reaching its peak or its end uh, until this very moment, we can highlight certain points that are relevant in terms of discussing these interconnections and security implications of the crime conflict nexus in Ukraine. First of all, the crime conflict nexus is a promising theoretical background that basically shows how powerful relationships influence the dynamics of the conflict and of illicit economies with different types of effects capable of increasing humanitarian and the refugee crisis in Eastern, in Eastern Europe and in Europe. Uh, these discussions can probably show how blurred is becoming the line between organized crime and the state, how dangerous it is the combination between regular and irregular threats how deep are the connections between the micro and macro level analysis? How deep the criminal infiltration and integration will take, pay, will take place during and after the Ukrainian conflict? How illicit flows will rearrange themselves during this moment and after the conflict ends? And who knows, maybe extra regional and regional opportunities will appear for new collaborations between violent non-state actors in Ukraine and in Eastern Europe. All of these trends makes us believe, at least from the, uh, at this very moment, that sustainable peace is a distant dream in Ukraine, unfortunately, because all the trends we're seeing and all the speculations we can have during this moment and with the available information we have show, shows us that the situation uh, around the current 
uh, Ukrainian conflict is really complicated and it's far from ending. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope everybody enjoyed this presentation. Thank you very much, Andre. You're asking a lot of questions. Uh, it will be interesting to see whether these questions will come back in our discussion later on. But now I would like to invite um, the presenters of our last presentation um, who will talk about, actually again, ask the question, why the issues of organized crime are absent in Lithuanian public discourse. Um, so I would like to welcome uh, Professor Alexandras Dobrininas, who uh, and Maria Schupa, both from the uh, Institute of uh, Criminology, the Department of Sociology and Social Work at Vilnius University. Um, Maria, I suppose you will start the first, right? Or Alexandras? Might be, might be I start and uh, Maria continue, and might be after I finished again. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's a uh, uh, hello again, and it's uh, it's a pleasure to participate in uh, these conferences uh, and with uh, to discuss this issue with uh, uh, with our team. Uh, actually, uh, our presentation not uh, directly connected uh, with uh, organized crime and uh, war in Ukraine. It's uh, might be indirect. Uh, aspect uh, 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 what we want to do uh, in uh, in our uh, research uh, uh, not only uh, to ask the questions uh, why uh, organized crime is not presented in for example professional or in, even in public discourse but uh, just to to look carefully how it's happened uh, uh, especially its continuation of uh, our previous research uh, the main idea was that uh, there is some reasons uh, uh, the uh, uh, academic research on organized crime in, in Lithuania is um, uh, underrepresented, and uh, this uh, place was uh, uh, occupied by uh, by uh, by media. It's media presentation in different form, for example, a uh, kind of uh, doctor fi documentary fiction, or even in uh, uh, news uh, presentation and. Uh, uh, just we uh, try to to uh, to realize what uh, what we can learn from from this media presentation. Um, uh, uh, actually, our uh, our previous presentation was connected with uh, the uh, uh, issue of uh, Ill 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 illegal migration uh, from uh, Belarus border to Lithuania. Uh, how it was uh, presented in media, and uh, our con conclusion was that again. Uh, uh, we uh, in media we can find uh, the uh, reference to uh, to the organized uh, organized crime network, which is uh, uh, very important for understanding the uh, whole full picture. And right now uh, we have uh, another uh, another case. We have uh, another kind of uh, migration wave, but it's uh, happened due to the. Uh, 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 Russian war against uh, against Ukraine and uh, a lot of uh, refugees uh, just uh, flow to uh, to neighbors countries, and again we just try to uh, to figure out what's going on uh, with uh, presentation of this law. And again, our uh, our, our our main questions: Can we uh, see here again this threat for uh, for victims of, of of crime, for refugees from uh, organized crime issues? So, and uh, just we want to present uh, our findings. So, Maria, it's your turn. All right. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so, just to give some context. Uh, since the beginning of the war, uh, there has been a huge flow of refugees, uh, people escaping the war into various countries in the U European Union and beyond. And here you can just see some numbers. Uh, and of course, here you can see that Poland, uh, Germany and the Czech Republic were the countries that took in the largest numbers. But also in Lithuania, according to the latest uh, data from the beginning of October, we have around uh, 66,000 uh, Ukrainians. So um, <clears throat> to connect a little bit to the questions of organized crime and maybe also to reflect on what Oleksiy and Anna have been presenting. So uh, they mentioned that perhaps uh, organized crime, uh, at least some forms of organized crime uh, are reduced uh, or displaced. So actually by looking at some um, 
titles of media publications uh, from around Europe, as well as uh, agencies such as the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime or Europol, uh, we can see that some forms of organized crime, they actually follow uh, the flow of migrants. And these are very different uh, sorts of offenses, and some of them are definitely connected to organized crime, like, for example, human trafficking. So, uh, in general, this problem, this question of how uh, organized crime seems to uh, follow around whenever there are large uh, groups of people moving, it is present, and there are at least some connections. Uh, and uh, uh, we have also looked at some of the uh, local press in countries like here, for example, you can see um, a title of an article from the Czech Republic. Uh, but what was interesting is that in some countries, like for instance, Poland uh, and Slovakia, a quick search did not give any results. There was more discussion of war crimes, but no discussion of uh, crimes that are related to migration processes. So uh, this puts in context what we uh, later found uh, in Lithuania. And what we basically did um, is uh, we took uh, the largest media portal operating in Lithuania, so it's the news, uh, and uh, most of the people read it, at least sometimes. And we looked at publications since the beginning of the year 2022 until the end of September. Uh, and we looked at articles focusing on migration. So uh, migration connected to Ukrainian refugees, but also uh, other uh, migration flows. And uh, of course, since last year, we have had something which was called um, uh, by the media and by state institutions a migration crisis on the Lithuanian Belarusian border. And uh, it is still ongoing in a way. So there are still publications about it. And what uh, was interesting compared to our prior expectations, uh, early thought there should be less articles about uh, the border situation compared to uh, Ukrainian uh, situation, but actually there were a bit more articles. Uh, and then we did some analysis of uh, the contents uh, with mixed methods, so basically analysis of frequencies, but also analysis of clusters of meaning. Um, and here are the results. <clears throat> and the results showed a few interesting things in general about how these uh, two different flows of migrants are portrayed. So uh, there are basically two key terms used by the media. So when talking about uh, the migrant uh, influx from the Lithuanian Belarusian uh, border, the key term is migrants. Uh, and there is emphasis on the migration as an illegal uh, process, and of course, uh, also a huge role of um, Belarus, as you can see, and um, state institutions, um, border guards, uh, state border guard service, and others. And uh, many of these articles are uh, just keeping the topic going. So these are, for example, weekly reports from the border guard service about the situation. Um, and uh, not so much analytical information, but what stands out is the uh, confluence, the portrayal of this flow of migration as illegal migration. And uh, on the other hand, when uh, we see Ukrainians, we always uh, see them portrayed very differently. So as refugees, and these are two different words, migrants and refugees, um, and in contrast to this uh, first cloud, you can see that Ukraine really stands out here. So when we talk about what is called so-called illegal migration, we do not see here even remotely uh, mention about the countries of origin of these people. We do not see mention of uh, war or any other reason that they're migrating for. But uh, with Ukrainians, the narrative is very clear. 
Um, and th there is also some focus on, for example, work and employment, which in case of illegal migrants is actually seen as a risk. So <clears throat> the same uh, situation is framed very, very uh, differently. And there's also, uh, when we look at clusters of meaning, some um, emphasis on support. So uh, social services, help, uh, acceptance, uh, education, and um, similar things. And now to interpret uh, what is going on and to kind of make it full circle back to the question of where is organized crime, because as you could uh, maybe notice, we have not a word related to crime in either of these clouds. So now um, I'm passing back the stage to Alexandros to finish up. Okay, uh, thank you, Maria. Uh, so actually, uh, uh, we use uh, the same uh, the same scheme as in, in our previous uh, uh, presentation, uh, which, which we did uh, years ago. Uh, the same uh, scheme from uh, 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 <coughs> Barrett's uh, mythologist. Uh, for uh, understanding how uh, how we create the narration about these two different flows of uh, you know of, uh, migrants and refugees, so uh, the situation is, is that uh, both uh, uh, are presented as uh, the victims of war, uh, war in the Middle East or war, for example, in uh, in 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 Ukraine. But uh, uh, we have a different uh, tr uh, treatment. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, Western countries uh, uh, accused by, uh, by representatives of, uh, of other countries that uh, uh, they differently treated uh, uh, refugees from, from Ukraine, from those who come from, from Iraq, for example, also from Syria. But uh, I believe that this scheme just uh, uh, briefly explained uh, what, 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 what is the main, main difference and why it's happened, at least in, in, in case of, uh, in, of Lithuania and uh, presentation of, uh, of this two, two narration uh, in Lithuanian media. So we have uh, 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 Signifar uh, crossing the border, but uh, we have two different aspects. Is it's legal or uh, illegal? And if we have uh, illegal, we have uh, absolutely different Signifar. We have unwanted asylum seekers. It's uh, just a legal term for this person who came. If, for example, it's legal in case of uh, Ukrainian, uh, Russian or Ukrainian uh, <laughs> war victims, they welcome temporarily protected. So it's uh, it's, uh, it's 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 presented uh, in in our media, and uh, after we have to join with uh, uh, references to um, uh, political context, uh, we have two different countries: uh, uh, Belarus, who actually has a negative connotation because of uh, its allies with Russia and with uh, authoritarian uh, way of uh, making uh, making policy, and we have uh, our. Uh, 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 our, our allies, uh, Ukrainian, with, with, uh, with our support, with our uh, respect for, for their fighting against aggression, and it's uh, a positive co uh, connotation. And uh, 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 after in, in connotation, uh, we have a different uh, different narration. Narration uh, where we uh, uh, at least presented in media uh, illegal migrants like a tools of uh, hybrid, hybrid, hybrid war that actually organized uh, by uh, Eastern uh, uh, authorities, uh, authoritarian states, vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis, uh, a victim of aggression that, uh, that comes uh, from, with emotional support from, uh, for victims of uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. So in this case, it's two, two main narration and they uh, over occupied uh, the, uh, the public discourse. And uh, uh, the consequences for organized crime, uh, the same. We uh, cannot fix uh, the problem of organized crime, at least in the Finnish media. Uh, probably uh, it uh, could be also presented for uh, Polish media, but I'm, I'm not, uh, not clear right now. So it should be, uh, should be investigated uh, separately. Why it's happened, it's probably another question. Questions for, for further, uh, further research, but Still, we uh, uh, our our conclusion is that uh, this two narration are free from a serious uh, uh, um, 
serious investigation uh, about the consequences for victims of crime and the threat for uh, for their safety and freedom because of uh, dangers uh, of a criminal network that uh, actually follow you know uh, all, all all migration process so it's uh, probably all our conclusions and uh, thank you for your attention Thank you very much, Alexandras and Maria, uh, for this interesting presentation. And now we will uh, open the discussion. Uh, and um, I would like to, to start. If and We do have some questions, but uh, I take an opportunity as a chair to, to, to start this discussion uh, with a very important theoretical question, which comes from the first presentation of, my, uh, of uh, Anna and Alexei. Um, where they do not see war or actually the, the traditional way of seeing war as a golden opportunity for organized crime, uh, you are turning it around and uh, showing that war can be also a threat to organized crime. And my question here comes, um, uh, you, you make a distinction between local and, and, and the more um, big criminal organizations. And my question is, where are these traditional organized crime groups? Uh, what are they doing at this moment in this context of, of the war? We, we, we know that U Ukraine has quite um, infamous uh, organized crime groups uh, operating also internationally, but um, especially in Odessa and uh, in, in, in Kiev as well. But where are these criminals? And this uh, also coming, um, with a question which uh, somebody asked here about the human trafficking. Huh? Human trafficking, which is considered today one of the uh, biggest problem or biggest um, opportunity for organized crime, especially uh, bringing so many um, women and children to, to uh, outside of, of Ukraine and to exploit them, especially in, in, uh, in prostitution. Uh, so I would want to know more about what, what are the criminal or organized crime, traditional, what we know as organized crime in Ukraine are involved in now. What, what is their position and where are they in this, uh, in this war? I'll try. You know, it's a very, I think you've asked a really important questions, but a very difficult ones as well, right? So if we, Alexei, if I may start and you correct me yeah, at yeah. any point of time, right? If we say that That's traditionally, true. right, um, discussing the issues of organized crime with Alexei over the last uh, few years, uh, we would separate organized crime into, say, different levels, right? The level of where sort of uh, uh, upper upper world uh, and the networking with politicians and then goes down, down, and the, the most sort of traditional form, uh, as you mentioned, Odessa, uh, the most traditional forms of organized criminality. So. What we, um, what we are suggesting is that um, on all the levels within Ukraine, right? We are, I've noticed some of the questions uh, take us into the European countries. However, the research Alexei is referring and our understanding or at least of the situation in the country, at least in the country, what we are arguing is that the war presents significant limitations for uh, many organi existing organized criminal groups because of the roots, because of the threat of exposure by different organizations. So that, that is significant because of, for example, uh, and again, I, I know that we have a presentation on ports, right? It would be interesting to see how port and the city of Odessa, how uh, the, the war has challenged uh, created uh, uh, well, less opportunities for the port to operate as a sort of a uh, chan channel for illegal trade. Um, uh, Alexei, well, I'll, do you want to add something? And I'll, I'll, I'll gain my thoughts. Yes, I want to add, uh, Dina, it depends on the level of criminality. So local criminal groups, bottom level uh, or underworld criminal groups, um, they're robbing or burglaring. Uh, they feel um, more freely in that in these conditions of the war because um, an, an uncertain um, law field, uh, for example, on the first days and weeks of this war, a lot of criminal groups starting um, wearing the uniform of territorial defense, uh, 
uh, and do robbering. They robber uh, cars. Uh, they go into the houses. But all this stopped very quickly. So they use uh, uncertain uh, regulation, um, unclear regulations. Uh, but within months from beginning of the war, it all will be stopped, all be catched. Uh, they go to the prison. And this was stopped. Other part of criminal activity we also discussed with Anna is anecdotal evidences when they appeared on the Russian controlled territories. Uh, they begin uh, collaborating with uh, Russians. So uh, near the Kharkiv was uh, uh, there is one of the city near the border on the Russian Ukrainian border, captured in the first days, Volchansk city. So famous. Uh, leader, criminal leader in this uh, town became main collaborator of uh, in this city with uh, Russian occupants. So small gangs, uh, small criminality feels good, but uh, upper level, uh, all chains broken. This is our point. So small criminal groups feels good, big criminal groups, groups and and. If you uh, remember the slide, uh, number of international criminal groups, uh, many years is stable. Six, seven, 10, 11, last years it's 11. Criminal groups with international links detected in Ukraine each year, no more. So it's stable number. So this is not increasing, but with corrupted links, national on the national level uh, in, increased number of criminal groups and significantly increased number of uh, organized criminal groups with general, with general character. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the ideas is that uh, Ukrainians and Russians have the war, but organized crime from Ukraine and from Russia do not have a war. They collaborate with this. And uh, I, I didn't hear from this, uh, from you about these connections between Russian organized crime and Ukrainian organized crime. But maybe again, this is also something which needs to be uh, studied more. There is another, well, actually several questions which, uh, which uh, I received here in chat. Um, are uh, regarding the um, arms trafficking. And the, the question, uh, the main question is of course, the, all the guns and all, all this um, support from, from, the, from, from the European Union to Ukraine, how can it also affect the, uh, the country's uh, safety after war if we, we will look forward because this uh, this weapon will will remain probably in ukraine and uh, as you know there is uh, there is quite concern about in which hands uh, in which uh, hands this uh, these arms will uh, go and i i think andre it was a question to you specifically about these uh, scenarios or predictions uh, about this uh, specifically uh, weapon trafficking. Can you maybe answer this? Yes, the pleasure is all mine. Uh, that's a good question, actually. That's, these are wonderful questions, actually, because I saw somebody else posted on the chat something about weapon smuggling. So the thing is, first of all, more than 20 Western countries transferred firearms to Ukraine in order to help, in order to help the country with its war efforts against Russian invasion. And some experts are warning about the chances of these guns fall into the hands of organized crime and terrorist organizations throughout Europe and in other regions, other neighbor, uh, neighboring regions. This situation became, uh, becomes even more alarming when once one considers that scientific evidence shows that firearm circulation in a country or in a region increase firearms related mortality in the form of homicides, suicides and accidents, opportunities for diversion to criminal activity, decrease gun prices in the illegal market and increase the chances of firearms trafficking uh, increase in a certain uh, country or region. So when we are speaking about weapon smuggling now, uh, considering the current uh, russell ukrainian conflict, we must acknowledge the fact that these weapons might probably 
fall into the hands of the wrong people. And this is even alarming. And a lot of violent non-state actors might enjoy this opportunity to profit or to enhance their power over political structures. And I, I saw that one question was, uh, was about IRA and other European territory, uh, terrorist organizations. Right now, we don't have any clue of what is happening with these guns. Everything is new. Everything is happening right now. So, yeah, these guns might fall into the hands of these types of organizations. But at the same time, I believe that these things are might not happening as well. We don't know yet. We need to study arms trafficking patterns uh, regionally and cross-regionally in order to understand if these kind of, of weapons are falling into the hands of these specific organizations that someone just asked me. If, if I may add a couple of points, Dina, if it's okay, and then maybe Alexi could add. A few years ago, we looked at the issue with Alexi of um, uh, weapon traffic, and it was, uh, I think, 2016 or 2017, so post-conflict, post-2014. And um, of course, Ukraine, if you think about it, Ukraine inherited a huge stockpile of uh, weapons after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So in Ukraine, uh, the, the opportunities actually to, to illegally trade in weapons with the old weapons was quite significant uh, before. Um, what we have seen is that uh, post 2014, when the conflict just started, for a short period of time, um, criminal gangs started using less knives and more um, small arms, right, in, in their criminal activities. But then I think, um, Alexei, if I'm correct, it, it sort of happened for about at, at least the statistics, right? Police recorded statistics showed this increase for no longer than half a year. And then it went sort of back to, to where it was. Um, we have noticed different sort of, again, different levels of uh, groups involved in trafficking of weapons. Um, for example, um, again, something that was reported in the media and something that police recorded is post-2014, significant number of people who were living in the sort of gray zones uh, start getting involved in weapon trafficking uh, as the weapons sort of, I suppose, it's right to assume that the more weapons isn't it coming into the country, the more likely the chances are that these weapons will be traded uh, or, or find themselves into the um, different groups. Then the issue is which groups, right? Uh, and then it's something that would be interesting to explore. For example, uh, recently watched documentary on, on, uh, on YouTube uh, about um, a particular uh, small city in the east of the country where local people uh, in the first days of war, uh, when the sort of uh, uh, Russian uh, army started sort of uh, coming in, uh, local men uh, got together and uh, they, uh, well, they publicly discussed that they knew where the weapons were uh, in, in a particular military camp. They opened the uh, warehouse, uh, armed themselves and defended the, their city and be very successful with it. And then months later, when police uh, uh, arrived back, uh, they started sort of, I suppose, uh, dealing with the legal issues of what, they, what they've done. So it would be very interesting to, to, to look at the use of weapons, isn't it? And precisely to discuss different groups and the, the use of weapons by different groups. I want to give small answer. It depends on the level because my country uh, almost eight years in war so we experienced this um, huge um, f illegal uh, flows of uh, small arms and anecdotal uh, cases was uh, someone go fishing with grenades so for these years and um, uh, our country have experience how to deal with small arms good legislation uh, and we can tackle this but if you asking about uh, bigger arms, what happened with this uh, is different history, completely okay, different you. history. Thank you. Um, there is a question I want to, uh, to, to, to read it to Andre, and then I would like to ask um, Alexandra and Maria something. Um, this question is referring to, um, uh, Regina is asking whether, I believe that Andre is referring to the approach of sustainable wars. Are there any 
data pointing to a social group profile, profiling, especially from the war economy. Andre, it's okay, clear. perfect. I forgot to answer this question. Thank you, Dina. Uh, so, yes, Mary Calder's approach is one of the approaches that I am trying to analyze inside my research. But Mary Calder's and Oliver Kings, if I'm not mistaken, is also uh, is also an important author uh, in order to discuss these cases involving resource wars and the whole discussion involving greed or grievance. What are the motives for armed conflicts? And basically, what I am trying to do with my colleague in this article that we are trying to write is the following. We are trying to say that it's not enough to see only the economic motives that makes people turn to criminal activities or illicit markets. We need to look at structural uh, variables such as uh, bad governance, uh, a dysfunctional state, and other types of variables that complement the economic variable that resource wars explains a lot. So in the case of someone profiting from the war economy right now, I didn't find any evidence that somebody, a social group is benefit is benefiting, benefiting right now from the war economy uh, in the current Russo-Ukrainian uh, Russo conflict. But the thing is, there are a lot of examples where illicit economics actually helped uh, civil society to overcome unemployment. So there are some people inside civil society that actually profit from illicit economies because there are structural variables that makes a, cer a certain country to be dependent of a certain illicit economy. And civil society end up uh, getting caught in the middle and end up profiting not because not because a certain social group loves a illicit economy, but because they depend on that illicit economy to pay their bills or to buy food or something like that. Okay, thank you, Andre. Um, I have a question now to Alexandra and Maria regarding your claim or your argument that, of course, there is no organized crime or it is not appearing in the media. But of course, the whole discussion in other European countries on the risk of human trafficking and exploitation is quite, um, quite visible. So um, don't you see in Lithuania any, um, any indications that this risk of human trafficking uh, is, is conducted by organized crime? Or can you say this is absolutely disorganized crime? Okay, so we can we can only guess, of course, because we need more 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 reliable data and not only media presentation. Media presentation just shows that it's not on the on the focus of uh, in public discourse in Lithuania. But uh, nevertheless, we have uh, some uh, some information about uh, about incident with, uh, with with this issue. And uh, again, there are some uh, indirect uh, uh, evidences, let's say, uh, that show that uh, uh, it uh, it should be at least uh, it's happened. And there are present, uh, there are information uh, from other countries, for example, from Germany, from Czech Republic already. Maria Maria mentioned this presentation, so uh, I think that uh, uh, it's a, it's a it's a problem of uh, uh, Taking uh, attention to, to this issue, it just uh, uh, just just not in the focus. It's not uh, how to say it's uh, it's uh, it's 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 not uh, discussed uh, concretely. Uh, maybe it's just because of the fact that we need to to solve uh, other problems. Other problem problem for supporting uh, refugees is much more important. But uh, uh, but I believe that uh, uh, earlier or later uh, these questions uh, will uh, will rise as well as um, more 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 fundamental questions about organized crime and uh, it's already already mentioned but uh, at least for me for my understanding the the major question uh, in, in 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 this context in the context of uh, 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 Russian war against Ukraine it's uh, it's the role of criminal groups. In initiating of such type of war, you know, it's a famous uh, Clausewitz uh, uh, statement that the war is a continuation of politics by, by an, another way. 
I, I, I must to, uh, re re rephrase this, uh, this statement. It's a continuation of, uh, let's say, criminal activity in another way, especially having in mind that we have a lot of research about so-called criminal state in, in Russia. So, and uh, uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's a good question to, to investigate to what extent uh, uh, these criminal group, uh, groups could uh, could capture the state. It's, 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 it's classical state capture. And after what's happened uh, when, uh, when we start to solve problem, not in, let's say, it's a civilized way, but uh, like in criminal groups, like in, uh, in, 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 in absolutely different level. Uh, and uh, we have a again a lot a lot a lot of materials about uh, uh, that uh, that proof that probably this uh, this angle is a, uh, is it could be could be very important for understanding uh, of what was going on not only formal uh, social uh, economical uh, indicators and variables but also a very specific way of make make how to say doing uh, doing criminal business uh, in 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 this area uh, not only in russia but to now all, all in all these post soviet criminal groups okay thank you alexandras i want to read another question to all i think to all uh, panelists um the question is pertaining to the efficiency of the legal framework especially in the times of war uh the legal framework in targeting organized crime groups. Um, is it because the legal framework crumbles specifically during wartime that breeds more crime? This is a question, uh, and I don't know whom shall I ask first. Maybe somebody wants to volunteer. Okay, yeah, I'm starting <laughs> answering yeah. this question. I think it's wrong. Uh, legal framework uh, strengthened strength, strength, strength in, in war times because more police on the streets, uh, all perform their duties more carefully, uh, citizens watching uh, curfew again. So uh, legal framework works more efficiently during war. Uh, so we see this on the data I'm presenting. We observe decrease of regular criminality because uh, more, pat more police on the streets, more patrol police, uh, uh, more serious, um, uh, they more seriously react to uh, any type of illegal activity because uh, country in war, so um, even the citizens more uh, involved, uh, more participation, volunteering in the um, law enforcement, they report about suspicious activities. So it's bad time for any type of crime and for organized crime too. So it's legal from work um, became more strange in the times of war. It's my response. Okay, thank you, Alexei. Somebody else wants to refer to this specific question? If yeah, not, may I say something, Dina? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Andre, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to say that I believe that legal framework is just, is just one of the variables. I believe that legal framework uh, might, might be an intervening variable in this sense, but I believe that sometimes the conflict itself might crumble the legal framework. So I believe that the crime conflict nexus provides some relevant insights in this sense, uh, as well as to identificate, uh, as well as to identify another type of variable besides the legal framework that enacts crime. Uh, there, there is a whole lot of discussions uh, trying to identify whether conflict is an enabler, a driver, or a facilitator of illicit economies. And it's a lot of different ways of putting this, uh, the subject at place. And I believe that there are relevant insights that arise from this type of discussion. So. Okay, thank you. So uh, I will conclude because we're out of time. Thank you very much all of panelists for this uh, great panel, very difficult times, very difficult subject, very difficult connection. Uh, I'm happy that uh, everybody could, could join us, um, Alexei and you specifically, and um, let's hope for, for peace. Thank you for listening to this episode of the OC24 podcast from the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organised Crime. 
This talk was just one of 85 from this year's 24-hour conference on global organised crime. To get access to the rest, head over to oc24.haysummit.com. Thanks for listening. <laughs>